we want to reassure you straight away that nothing's actually attacking you. Panic attacks are not dangerous. They are just extremely uncomfortable. We use the word panic attack. That's a generally accepted term. Everybody knows what it is. From a phenomenological perspective, it sure feels like an attack. So I, I get that. I understand why we say that. But is it really? Is it really an attack? We we'll never, ever intend to undermine or devalue your feelings. I like to reframe the word panic attack to adrenaline flood or an adrenaline rush. Hmm. Because one, that's more accurate. And two, it sounds less scary. The difference from one panic attack to the other was whatever thought I latched onto in that particular panic attack or that particular episode. Welcome to Disordered. We are up to episode six today. Today's episode is entitled Panic Attack. Anyway, welcome everybody. I am Drew Linsalata. I am a graduate student in clinical mental health counseling and a future therapist in training here in the U.S. in the state of New York. And I'm Joshua Fletcher, a uh, psychotherapist based in the UK, specializing in anxiety. Here we are. Welcome, Josh. How you doing? I like how you uh, said the, the title there, Panic Attack. Attack. Uh, is there a reason why we've uh, named it as a question? Yeah, I think there is. First of all, I appreciate you pointing out my master thespian skills, <laughs> as good as it gets for me. But uh, yeah, I think it's important that we question that. Because people, we use the word panic attack. That's a generally accepted term. Everybody knows what it is. But is it really? Is it really an attack? And I think you and I are in somewhat of an agreement. And calling it that might be doing ourselves a disservice. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're, we're two people that know what it's like to have like, severe anxiety. Oh. And when you're anxious, imagine the connotations with the word attack. You know, when actually we want to reassure you, you know, straight away that nothing's actually attacking you you know panic attacks are not dangerous um they are just extremely uncomfortable you know and i don't know who came up with the word attack but it, uh, we'd like to challenge that and i often challenge that um do you find it helpful drew do you find the word attack to be helpful well, I mean, I guess from a, you know, phenomenological perspective, it sure feels like an attack. So I, I get that. I understand why we say that. But to me, the word attack also implies a connotation of some sort of outside force that comes to get you over which you have no influence. It just shows up on your front door. And I know it feels that way, but I find it mm. to be more empowering if we say, well, it's not an external thing. It's coming from inside you and it's not attacking you. It's just an inappropriate response. And we'll get into that. But mm. Sometimes I find it's a hard sell. People really like panic attack. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do. And, and, and bear, you always remember that on this podcast, we will never, ever intend to undermine or devalue your feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does come from a place where, I mean, I must have had thousands of panic attacks. I don't know about you, Drew. Mm -hmm. um, but what helped me, and we're, we're only going to share with you what we feel helps and what we'll, when I work with people in my practice, is that I like to reframe the word panic attack to adrenaline flood or an adrenaline rush. Hmm. Because one, that's more accurate. And two, it sounds less scary. And if something's less scary and more accurate, then I tend to kind of use that. Now, before we go on a bit more, let's, let's actually clarify what we mean by a panic attack. What's actually happening during it? Because... Hmm. Not everyone's panic attacks present the same, do they? No, I think, well, that's always interesting because I think physiologically, if we hooked all of us up to monitoring and everybody had a panic attack, we'd all probably look about the same. But I think experientially, we, they are different because people wind up, wind up being a little bit more afraid or a little bit more focused on certain aspects, certain symptoms of the panic attack. So for some people, it's a a gastrointestinal problem. For some people, it's just that fear of doom or dread. For some people, it's a heart thing or a breathing thing or a dizzy thing or a depersonalization thing. So yeah, you if you put 100 people in the room, you get 100 different descriptions of what a panic attack is based on what is most scary for each individual person, I think. But the yeah. thing is probably about the same for all of us. We're not that yeah. common. And some of the most common symptoms of a, of a panic attack are, I mean, for me, it was... Um, suddenly overwhelmed by a sense of doom and dread. Mm -hmm. Sometimes my heart would palpitate. Sometimes it didn't. Sometimes I feel that derealization 
and that and that detachment that we spoke about in the last few episodes. Sometimes I wouldn't. Um, sometimes I'd feel very hot and sweaty. Sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes I'd freeze, and sometimes I'd want to pace around as much as I as I could because I felt this surge, this adrenal this adrenal surge. Yeah. Um, and they always came up racing thoughts as well. I just can't stop my thoughts if I try if I tried. Mm-hmm. But it always came with thoughts like, what if I have a heart attack? What if I go crazy? What if I never feel the same again? That's how mine presented. Yeah. Did, how, how did yours present, Drew? I, I would say that um, I had some common themes that ran through almost all of them, but it's hard to say because they were somewhat different. And for me, uh, the common themes for me were the depersonalized feeling. The feeling like mm. I was not real or I was outside of myself. That was the most disturbing thing. My heart was always pounding. Sometimes it would be skipping beats. I felt like I couldn't breathe. Um, I get that, like, just jitter. I would literally, people would know because I would start to shake my leg, right? Like, involuntarily. I didn't even know I was doing it until mm. they found out. But for me, I discovered over time as I got more experience with it that, like, oh, the difference from one panic attack to the other was whatever thought I latched onto in that particular panic attack or that particular episode. If it was a heart attack, that's so important. That's so uh, important, isn't it? Whenever I caught up in that moment, made it that kind of panic attack, if you will. It was yeah, weird. this is super super important as well for people. If you struggle with panic attacks and you're afraid of them, um, this is why I mean by panic attack that they, they, they're different each time because the whole point of, of of the anxious response, the threat response, is to make you doubt. So if you constantly had panic attacks over the same trigger, the same non-dangerous trigger, if it was a dangerous trigger, you know, an actual threat, then yeah, it's doing its job. Mm-hmm. But if you're having the same panic attack over the, a trigger that isn't dangerous, then actually your threat response is letting you down because the threat response, the amygdala, rewires itself when, you, when you're exposed to it. And nothing bad happens. The brain remembers that. And so what you need to remember is that actually, you know, it's okay for panic attacks to have different content. I remember I'd have panic attacks over going crazy. Well, I didn't go crazy, so it kind of shifted onto my heart. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't have a heart attack, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, and then it shifted onto not being able to go to the toilet in time and embarrassing myself. And then it then it shifted to... Um, going crazy because I'm too claustrophobic. Uh, and then it shifted to many things. However, physiologically, like Drew said, they were very similar. Although sometimes the, even f- the physical symptoms present differently. Mm-hmm. But what's universal that matches every panic attack is the fear of impending doom and loss of control. Yeah. Yeah. Like something bad is about to happen. Yeah. Utterly convinced. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I, one of the things I found interesting about in my own experience with panic attacks is I got as I got better and better at dealing with them, I I started to experience just that, where I wasn't really having that same massive physiological response. And I remember very clearly one night um, I, I had become friends with a couple of different people on YouTube back in the day, and we would, would share our stories on YouTube. And I remember looking into my crappy digital camera from two thousand eight or whenever it was, and asking. Hey, is it a thing to have a panic attack without the panic? But what I was feeling was not a lot in my body, but I still felt terrified. It was such a strange experience. I get that question a lot from followers. Do you get that? I, I get that. And I had that experience. It was interesting. It was like my my body was was getting the picture, but my my brain, you know, amygdala. Just it, it would not. <laughs> It was not following along yet. It was the trailing edge of, of recovery. And and I would still get that fear. I love how you leaned over to press it. So like... If you're watching on YouTube, you saw that. <laughs> There's nothing yeah. subtle about that whatsoever. Um, so, so you're saying you can have just a purely physical panic attack? Yeah, for me, it, it actually was opposite. There was, it wasn't purely physical. It was, it was mental. It was, it was the, just a feeling of fear being afraid, being convinced that something utterly disastrous was about to happen to me, but without having that super elevated level of racing heart, it was just the strangest experience. I'd say that that's the majority of my panic attacks. Well, now they are. If I'm going to panic now, which happens Mm. very rarely, but it can happen, it will look more like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I, and to be honest, in my experience and working with people, that's the vast majority of panic attacks. Mm. How many times have you had a panic attack or spoken to people where they people have had panic attacks in work meetings or at family gatherings in restaurants or out out with their friends? No one can notice it other than maybe a, a jittery leg or maybe you've had to ask someone to repeat themselves or you might be a bit pale, but the, the intense maelstrom of emotions inside are not really visible to those yeah. around you. Maybe you get a bit blotchy, maybe you get a bit red or whatever. To you, that having the panic, that probably feels magnified, but actually most people don't notice panic attacks um because yeah they're not actually that obvious whereas on you know if you see a panic attack on netflix or apple tv or something you know that someone's rolling around on the floor you know flashbacks because dad didn't come to your baseball game and all that and you know gasping for breath as you're crawling across "Mm, really you know as someone who in this practice works primarily with panic attacks i very rarely see stuff like that yeah I think two of the more interesting along those lines, more interesting um, visual depictions of panic that you'll ever see is, I don't remember, he was a news anchor here in the US, Harris, Dan Harris, I'm not sure. He actually wrote the book, uh, 10% Happier, which I only found out about after I wrote 7% Slower. Like, oh, how come nobody told me this? But anyway. Oh, he's the mindfulness dude, isn't he? Yeah, and yeah. He, he was a, a, on national television, ABC News, and he had a panic attack while doing the six o'clock news on national TV in the US. And when you see that video, it's on YouTube. He mm. just goes blank. He's not, it does not look like you would think, I know internally we feel like it's just a volcano erupting, mm. but he just mm. sort of goes blank. And it's a very accurate because he was literally having a panic attack on national TV. Mm. And Ted Lasso, which is a show that I really love, he, mm. he had I love Ted Lasso. having panic attacks. And I think that was a pretty accurate depiction. He just, right. could just see. he just got really disturbed and just sort of left and went outside and sat on the curb. And he it was not rolling around and screaming. And no. it was really good. They did a good job with it. Yeah, and I could relate to that. Yeah. You know, the, the, remember when we're talking about the threat response, the fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Mm. Most of my panic, well, it mixes between freeze. Like I just, I just have to freeze, and or, or sometimes it's get out, and you know it's a panic attack because you know you have this urge to just get out. But remember, that is a deeply intrinsic, uh, inherited part of your brain. The final mm. flight that's that's literally like flight run this danger yeah but what you've got on your side is that you still got choice mm-hmm. now the easy choice is to leave if you have panic attacks which i did for a very long time and realized mm-hmm. actually that that doesn't help mm-hmm. um or you can start to you know willfully tolerate it which again we'll we'll talk about more of that further on in the podcast but we just want to let you know that we know how, how it feels you know do you have a worst one or do you have a top three of panic attacks you know i discovered and again in my own experience that i, I kind of had to call myself out a little bit because for a while there every panic attack was the worst one this was the worst one this oh was yeah the- do, you, do you hear that like yeah. i had the the mother of all panic attacks yes. the monster the the big, biggest of all panic attacks when, when I actually know that they're all the same. You're either yeah. 10 out of 10 anxious or you're not. There's so I no, go, yeah. I only, I have a top one panic attack and that top one is the first one I ever had because it was such a memorable experience and so frightening and it really kicked off all of the nonsense. But, uh, so I really only have a top one, but that it was the mother of all panic attacks. This is where social media based support is always interesting because when someone say in my Facebook group says it was, this was the most severe one I ever had. Like, you know, be careful because social media has a memory and then you can go back and show them here was the most severe one two months ago. Here was another most severe one eight weeks ago. Here was the most severe one six months ago that you talked about. Yeah. And it's always an interesting proposition because people, oh, oh, I guess you're right. You know, that's always an interesting moment. And I had to do that to myself. It's interesting as well what they mean by severe because physiologically it was probably the same, but yeah. maybe they're talking about social consequences or yeah, I maybe the 
maybe the stakes were higher. Maybe it was the, the same anxiety attack, but they, it stopped them from going on holiday or sure. it was the same anxiety attack, but they had to leave the wedding early or whatever. And, but what you've got to remember is that this anxiety attack, panic attack, adrenaline flood, mm-hmm. um, it's, it is the same physiologically, but we often measure it by the impact it's had on us socially. Yeah, emotionally. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, like actually, oh no, I had an anxiety attack at home, and mm-hmm. actually, it was probably exactly the same physiologically as the one I had at work. But the one I had at work, I had to tell my boss I had to go home, and so therefore, that is the mother of all panic attacks. That was the worst one yet, the severe. Yeah. Well, actually, no. Kindly remind yourself that this is something that you're enduring all the time. Try not to rank them in order. It doesn't help, does it, Drew? No, I don't think it helps at all because the propensity will be, and I get this, it's not a crime, by the way. It's not wrong to do this. It's it is a crime, and we will personally come and arrest you. <laughs> you will be thrown in some sort of 1500s British jail. <laughs> all right, governor. <laughs> That's exactly right. But I think to me, it was the realization that like, well, these are, are all kind of the same, and it's just, and I get this because I would say, yeah, but this one felt so so much scarier. And I like the idea for you, like it's the external consequence that it has that can influence that. But people will often say to me, yeah, but it just felt scarier. But okay. but, there, but, there, but there's method to that. There's a reason why your latest panic attack is always the scariest one. Yeah. And that is because that's the brain doing its job. Yeah. It yeah. has to fill you with doubt. So people who struggle with anxiety and panic attacks, including me, including Drew, mm-hmm. um, is this next one is scarier than the last one because when you're experiencing it, you are experiencing the maximum amount of doubt possible mm-hmm. because fear is doubt. That's all it is. The whole point of fear is to make you doubt. So you can't experience a panic attack rationally because it shuts down that part of your brain, opens up the threat response, the amygdala, mm-hmm. which triggers that physiological response which which gets you going because it is doing it's your body and brain is doing its absolute best to persuade you that you are in danger so Mm -hmm. you will hear stuff like what if this is the panic attack that makes it worse what if you're finally going crazy what if this is the time where your heartbeat you know heart explodes you know in front of everyone you know and whatever what if you collapse and faint what if this is the time you've really got to worry but actually listen to listen to that. That's actually the mechanics of your brain going, it's trying to help you. It's going, well, what if it's this? Mm-hmm. What if it's that? Because mm-hmm. it doesn't understand why your body is full of adrenaline. Yeah. It doesn't understand why your peripheral vision is opened up scanning for dangers. And- it has no idea. And so it's just giving you suggestions. It's going, well, maybe it's that. Maybe it's that. So when Drew said before, like, well, it latches onto something, that's exactly right. Because it's like, well, today, maybe it's this. Maybe it's maybe it's that maybe it's because i'm not getting enough sleep maybe it's because of this it's trying to help you by understanding the mechanics of when you have a panic attack in inverted commas yeah. you know actually this is really normal and it's called metacognitive awareness and that was massive for my recovery i don't know about you drew yeah understanding what it was like this is there's i understand it's trying to tell me and fill me with doubt really good i have a little anecdote i could share about that too but you know it's never actually proven itself out to be true. So I, I understand that it really wants me to listen to it and obey it. I get that. And I, and I appreciate what it's trying to do. But if I keep obeying it, it's going to keep doing that. And nothing ever gets better when I do that on the long term. You know, if I run out, I feel better in that moment. But then but I'm back what if that. this is the time, Drew, that it, that it went wrong. wrong? Yeah. So yeah. interestingly, I, I think... Uh, and, you know, the, the idea of like what the consequence could be is always such a big one. But what if? And so when you ask a large number of people, which I certainly have the privilege of doing, and you do, too, we have relatively large audiences that we are addressing. We have the privilege of that. What is one thing that keeps you from moving forward in your recovery? There were themes when I asked that question and many, many people asked it, answered it. And one of the, the top theme was doubt. But what if this time was the number one thing? What if this time? And I think you have to remember that 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 system that Josh is is talking about, that fear, that threat response system, it also has nothing to do with social systems, relationships, work, school. It's not interested. It has no knowledge of those things. It doesn't care that it's ruining your grandma's birthday party. 
It doesn't even know it's grandma's birthday party. It has one job and that's all it's doing. And it's really good at getting really loud and seeming really important and very urgent, but it's just doing the thing it's designed to do. That's it. That's all it's doing. Mm -hmm. So is that an attack? Or is that just a misguided, is it a bug? We, we can call it anything we want, but that's, I think, why we talk about like, well, maybe we should rephrase the idea of attack. It's just, mm. a, it's a, it's doing it at the wrong time. Yeah. Uh, and just remember as well, like, yeah, it's a mechanism that's uncomfortable, but you're not being attacked. You are safe. Mm -hmm. um, no one's ever died from panic attack, you know? But of course, what's really interesting is when people have panic attacks, it's whole, the whole purpose of the threat response is to make you doubt, a bit yep. like the cave analogy and the, and the lion analogy yep. and stuff like that. And so be prepared for your brain to do exactly what it's supposed to do. You're not broken, yep. but it will say, but what if I'm the first? <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> what, what if I'm the first? Oh, my great grandma died from a, her heart condition. What if I've inherited that and this panic attack pushes me over the edge? Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, uh, th that's it. I'm dead now. You know, what and if I I'm the exception to the rule? There we What's go. What's so interesting about that, too, is we be, we reason purely based on that emotional response. And, and I understand fear is powerful and it motivates us. So when you tell somebody, well, you're safe during a panic attack, uh, by show of hands, people listening, clearly we can't see your hands, but nonetheless, you know, how many people have heard that, but yet in the aftermath of a panic attack or when worried about your panic attacks, still go to Google to try to connect panic attacks and strokes and panic attacks and heart attacks and panic attacks and schizophrenia and psychotic breaks. I know you're doing it because we did it. So it will continue to feed that like you, you are the exception. You got to find proof that this is true. And it engages ex executive function in your mm -hmm. brain, which is just basically do something. Yeah. Because you know, that's what yeah. it wants you to do. Do something. You know, I, and how, how many times did you have that true where it's like, do something. This is why people, this is why I don't really like the phrase sit with it. Mm -hmm. I can't stand, you know, when you have a panic attack, sit with it. Well, no, I don't want to do that. I personally don't sit with it. What mm -hmm. they mean is accept it and do with right. it. Right. Uh, but I actually know when you sit with something, you give it attention. Mm. So I, if I was to rephrase it, like I'd sit with my back to it, maybe I'd sit mm. and ignore it, but I'm not going to sit with it because I'm not going to acknowledge it. Okay. It's there. But my brain is this whole part of me, this threat response. And part of it is the do it, do yeah. it. Actually, I'm just going to be like, well, I'm just going to do what non anxious me was doing because anything that diverges from what I was originally doing is telling the brain that, yeah, you're right to make me feel anxious right now. Yeah. So if I'm sat there and I'm reading a book or whatever, and I'm having this threat response, bang, panic attack, adrenaline rush, adrenaline flood, whatever you want to call it. And I'm reading and suddenly it hits me. Am I going to put that book down, you know, and start? No, I'm not. I'm going to try <laughs> to yeah. continue reading the book. Is that book going to be easy to read? No. What am I right. going to probably have to reread a few pages? Yes. But, or even if I finding it too hard to difficult to do that, I'll probably put the book down and slowly and calmly, compassionately, you know, go and maybe tidy the kitchen or just do something that doesn't conform to the immediacy that that threat response wants me to act in. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I think the threat response is the don't just sit there, do something. But in reality, it's, the best response is the other way. Don't just do something, sit there, but it's not literally sitting there. It's yeah, yeah. I suppose that could work if sitting with it. Where, where, what do you think you about it? Do you like it? No, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I don't like sit with it. I don't like, I've, I've used it and then I, it causes confusion and people will ask, I don't know, but do, but I, I'm sitting with it. Well, what were you doing when it happened? So focusing I, on it, obsessing right. about it. That's what people I used to will, do. Yeah, yeah. People will sometimes think, take that literally. And, and I get it. I understand why. And this is why we have psychoeducation, but, They'll hear people say, sit with it. And if they are in the middle of whatever dinner with fam with the family and they begin to experience panic or the, the, the adrenaline flood, they will get up from the dinner and go quietly and sit somewhere. Like, no, 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 you didn't, you didn't have to do that. Yeah. To me, it's stay in the context you were in. If I am sitting, like you said, I'm sitting quietly, whatever, and I begin to feel that, then I'm going to keep sitting quietly because that's what I was already doing mm. for some reason.
the, the best I can, but it's not, you're not optimal. I mean, it was really important when you said it's going to be easy to read that book. Hell no, but no. you can do the I, best you can. I love that sentence. You're not optimal. It's okay yeah. not to be optimal as well. It's right. okay. Yeah. You're probably yeah. going to be functioning at 40%. You know, Maybe. that's normal. Literally. And you've got to remember the Swiss psychoeducation is so important. Half you think your brain kind of shuts down. So your memory is <laughs> going to suck. Your decision making is going to suck. It's okay. You've got to be kind to yourself when you're doing that. Because if you start getting angry at yourself, well, I forgot what Josh and Drew said. I forgot what I was doing in my CBT. Or I forgot. That's okay. Yeah. Like, just just get through it. You're not going to do it perfectly. This, this, you can't. You yeah. can't do it. But the, the perfect way to do it is to acknowledge, I'm not going to do this perfectly. And do it anyway. Yeah. And do you the know, best you can with it. Do the best you can. Knowing... Yeah that actually yeah this is normal actually this is normal for this context that right. this isn't this is supposed to happen it's really right. interesting uh, i just want to add as well like when, when people say sit with it i found particularly for the ruminators mm -hmm. out there including me sit with it can often be misconstrued as an invitation to just ruminate mm -hmm. so just mm -hmm. sit there and play out the contest listen to everything the anxiety is telling you engage with it imagine all the worst case scenarios. Now that's not sitting with anxiety, that's sitting and giving all your attention to anxiety. Um, sit with it, you know, playing your PlayStation or your Xbox is a bit different. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna take a while to figure that out. You'll get it wrong, you'll stumble, that's okay. You, you get, mm. for me, I got way better at understanding what to do, inverted quotes, I guess, when I, the more I practiced, sometimes I, did a better job and sometimes I didn't, but each time it taught me a little something about what sitting means, what being active, what engaging means. You're learning as you're going. So not people don't rarely ever just get this right. Oh, Josh said to do this, and then boom, I did it. And wow, everything changed. No, it's a process. No, no, no. And you've got to yeah. again look out for the perfectionism in you that you can't do it. It's impossible. The paradox yeah. is there. You cannot to do it perfectly is to accept that you're not going to do it perfectly. Yeah. Um, and for some people, like, whoa. What on earth is that man talking about? I don't like that. Um, but yeah, well, you can't do it. Like you're gonna um we'll give some our own examples. So for me, when I was struggling um with panic attacks and agoraphobia, you know, uh one of the ones was just to walk through a park. You know, walk through a park, try and keep my attention external whilst mm -hmm. tolerating the adrenaline flood, the urge to run home to have my safe person on speed dial, mm. you know, or, to, or just to ruminate, even if I wasn't panicking, you know, just to ruminate walking through, you know, keep my attention external. How many squirrels can I see? How many people are ripping a bong on a park bench? How many smells can I, can I see? Well, how many different trees, how many different colored flowers? Yeah. Um, and yeah, could I do that perfectly? No, because my attention was flitting from outwards to inwards to outwards to inwards. But I was gently going, no, come on, bring it back outwards again. You can do this. Yeah. And stop turning around. Stop trying to map your route. Go and get lost in the park if you want. It's okay. You, mm -hmm. you don't need to run to safety. Um, yeah, I didn't do that perfectly to begin with. But then, you know, I think I was on my second visit to the park. I went really far in. Didn't have my magic bottle of water and all that. And just stood there and... I was like, it's pretty intense now. I was like, no, this is what I'm trying to do. This is the adrenaline flood. This is the panic attack that I'm trying to challenge. Yeah. And it lasted about six, seven minutes at that time. Everyone's different. So, and, yeah. and sometimes it can last, but I remember that time, six, seven minutes. And I was like, I can feel it passing. And I've not really done anything. And that is a wonderful feeling. Yeah. It leaves you with, there's no other conclusion you can draw then. That you're no. stuck. Your, your brain is in a corner now. Oh. It can only conclude that I didn't ever have to do anything before this. Yeah, and a week later, I was reading a book in that very same park. Isn't Wouldn't ever, ever imagine to do that because the threat response was like, okay, I get it. This park isn't dangerous. Yeah, fair enough. Mm. I think to bring it sort of back to the original thing before we get to our questions and our, and our did it anyways, when we question the use of the word attack, like the last couple of minutes where we talked about recognizing and being kind to yourself, you're not going to get it perfectly. You're practicing, you're learning new ways. The word attack often implies that there is a defensive strategy. When I am attacked, I have to do this. And that's why there's so many different acronyms and steps and methods and everybody tries to do a different method. But in the moment when you are being, air quotes, attacked, 
you will forget the letters, you will forget the steps, you will forget all of the things you won't know what to do. People say it all the time, it goes out the window. So you just do the best you can. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. your recall sucks when you're anxious. Yeah. So yeah, you, yeah, you're gonna forget the steps. And you can actually if you want, if you're starting out with if you someone who really struggles with panic attacks, yeah. you can just write it down on a bit of piece of paper. Yeah. Not as a like a as a magic paragraph yep. to make your anxiety go away. But just that I'm remembering what I need to do now. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. And I think that's the word attack leads to that idea that like, well, when attacked, I must respond. And no, you're not being attacked. So you don't really have to respond the way you thought. Yeah. So there you go. Should we do it? Should we do questions? Like we usually yeah. do questions yeah. anywhere? Anyways? Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's do that. Um, oh, we had what we, 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 uh, we had a good one, didn't we, before the, before we pressed record? Um, who is it from? Uh, the question, the question that we want to go through. Yeah. First, yeah, and it's right germane to the topic. So this is Barb in Sheffield, our fa our friend Barb. <laughs> Hi, Barb. Um, hey, Barb. Fellow north, fellow northerner. Yeah, exactly. And th this is a question that uh, she asked, but zillions of people have asked both of us. Yeah. What's the difference between a panic attack and an anxiety attack? What do you think? Um, at, officially, there's actually no such thing as as an anxiety attack. Um. Often people interchange it with panic attack. I had an anxiety attack, I had a panic attack. Um, there's not really a difference. I don't find them different. Uh, you hear lots of mistruths and weird descriptions on social media, like a panic attack is something that creeps up on you, whereas a panic attack strikes from nowhere. No, um, that's just nonsense. I don't think that's helpful rhetoric. Uh, and I say that as a therapist as well. It's I don't think it's helpful um yeah and, and actually both include the word attack so nothing's actually attacking you uh and physiologically they're the same you're having an adrenaline rush cortisol rush whatever you're having that threat response um another one i hear on social media is a uh, one has a trigger and one doesn't it's like no it's just nonsense there's no official definition of that um if you're going to keep one you know just call it well you can choose whatever one you want and then I just reframe that. I'm just having an adrenaline rush, whether it's an anxiety attack or a panic attack. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I hear stuff like, oh, um, I'm doing well with my anxiety attacks, but I'm afraid that a panic attack might get me. And I was like, that doesn't mean any, that, that means nothing. There's yeah. actually what I'm hearing is you've been doing really well tolerating your anxiety attacks. <laughs> you know, th there's nothing different. There's not a, a mega one hiding around the corner for you, which is quite relevant to what we've been talking about today. Yeah, I think that because the difference, I, I to me, I would question the question itself. Like, well, why do you need that information? What's what does it inform? What does it tell us? I mean, listen, psychoeducation is important, mm -hmm. and having an understanding is certainly important. But there comes a time when that question smacks of there's a line across which I will still believe I cannot cross. So please tell me when to know it's an anxiety attack because that'll deal with, and when it's a panic attack because that uh, no, like one hundred percent. Yeah, what are you going to do with this information? If, if we had a definition that all the clinicians in the world agreed on, which we do not, because there is, like you said, there is no definition of an anxiety attack, what would you do with it anyway? Oh, okay. I'm all right if I have an anxiety attack, but uh, not if I have a panic attack. I gotta go home. That's, yeah. That's also, you've, you've missed out on the fact that you've probably been absolutely <laughs> nailing it yeah. this whole time yeah. because you've poured all your energy into, oh, but then there's that one that I can't handle. When yeah. actually, actually, you've just been nailing it this whole time. You know, you've been, you've been doing brilliantly. I got to make a topic uh, entry here in our log because this is a thing we'll have to talk about, but it leads you to, if you are doing really well with your anxiety attacks, but you're afraid of your panic attacks, I would posit to say that you might not have a panic attack the way you define it because you help to make that. And if you're yeah. doing really well with the anxiety attack, you're not pouring the gas on the fire, the petrol on the fire anymore. So. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Anyway, good question. Uh, Thanks, Barb. That's a great question, Barb. Thank you. Uh, as always, I've got a good did it anyway. Apologies. I don't have, I screenshot this did it anyway from a while ago, but I didn't have their name. Uh, they didn't give me permission to give the name either. So I'm just going to read it out anyway. Um, I'm not sure where people are putting these hashtag did it anyways, but I want to include my own. On the weekend, I went to Brighton Pride. Always wanted to go there. Uh, it was my first trip away since pre-pandemic. I sat on the curb as the parade went by. No one around me would have noticed a nuclear bomb detonating in my head. I wanted nothing more than to reach out to my partner and demand we go home. Not the hotel, home, 50 miles away. 
I didn't. I stayed with it. The peak passed. Sure, I had an anxiety hangover with wobbles after, but I stayed the whole weekend. Now my amygdala knows that going away is safe. Oh, look, that's a banger, that one, isn't it? Hashtag did it anyway. That is really good. That that deserves a round of applause right there. Very good. That is the most Belted. British, most British did it anyway I've ever heard. Oh yeah. Brian's British a lovely player. Wobbles. Yeah, like I can't <laughs> I can't do any better than that. Um, mine comes from my Facebook group. Again, I won't use the person's name, but this person said just a couple of days ago, um, she said, I I am on day 17 of not checking my blood pressure. To be honest, oh. it's huge, right? I'm a bit scared to check it now since I feel it's been so long since the last time I checked it. And, you know, I know we talk all the time about doing things like sort of an agoraphobic context, but this is a health anxiety context. 17 days without checking her blood pressure is a huge did it anyway. Outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. Well, where's that applause button? Where's that applause? I mean, not applause. We've got a crowd in here now. We're That's recording. Video it. audience. Please, yeah. everybody, calm down. <laughs> we have a time limit. <laughs> Super. So. Well done. And, and I know how, how difficult it is just to just that, just one more check. One more check. Now you don't yeah. need to. Yeah. Well done. I think we're good. Uh, That's episode. Thank two. you. Thank you, Drew. I think we should probably spend an episode talking about how to talk to yourself or a loved one during a panic attack and that'd be a nice follow-up one uh what do you think how about we do that the next episode all right then see you in 10 minutes i'll go get a cup of tea uh, how about we're wearing the same things <laughs> in that episode sure well we will record that one next so stay tuned next week we'll talk about that one and i'll be back in a minute to wrap this one up and give you guys all kinds of cool links and stuff so thanks everybody thanks for tuning in yep hey it's drew Thanks for joining us for this episode of Disordered. Josh and I both hope that you're finding it helpful in some way. For more information about Josh or me or the Disordered podcast, find us on the web at disordered.fm. That's disordered.fm. Pop on over and find links to our social media platforms. Join our mailing list so we can let you know when new podcast episodes are available. And we'll send you easy ways to ask us questions and share your wins so we can answer questions on the air and share your successes with the community. And if you're listening to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any platform that lets you rate or review, do us a favor and leave us a five-star rating and maybe write a review if you're digging disordered. It really helps us out and we appreciate that. Thanks again for coming by and we'll see you in the next episode.